Motion is approved. That takes us to number nine on our agenda. The department reports the CWG NDR, CWGDR NDR program manager. Of course, we have Mr. John Zakin, who did have a handout for us uh, prior to the meeting, so we can follow along. Good evening, Mr. Zakian. Good evening, Mayor um, Alderman. Um, this originally was going to be um, my time to talk about the entire NDR program, but since we're devoting next Monday as a special council meeting to talk about the entire NDR program, um, several of the aldermen, including especially Alderman Strait, had asked at the last council meeting to get ahead of time a clear picture of where we are financially with all of the different um, buckets in the NDR. So what I thought I would do tonight is discuss um, three parts. One is how we got to the allocations that you have in the $74 million. Um, several of the key statutes that are always applicable and certainly will be, I'm sure, heavily discussed at next week's council meeting. And then the current standing of the budget of NDR by bucket. Um, let's see if this works. No. No. Derek? <laughs> This, that. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> By the way, does anybody, we, we, I, as a light note moment, we keep calling Derek. Does every, anybody realize that Derek is a real person or do they think <laughs> it's like an artificial? <laughs> is it like Siri, you know? He's not the AI, <laughs> the computer. Oh, there we go. Okay. I, Hopefully this will now work. So the first thing I wanted to walk you through, um, if you will recall, originally in 2015, the city submitted um, National Disaster Recovery Competition Phase Two application. They had been down selected from the phase one and they were one of the 40 competing grantees. The total amount that was requested in the phase two application was $174 million. The good news was that of the 40 plus competitors, only 13 received funds, and the city of Minot was one of the 13 that received the funds. The challenge was that they did not get $174 million, we got $74 million. So what then had to happen in the early part of 2016 was to reduce and in some cases eliminate projects and activities that had been in the original phase two application. What I want to do is quickly run through what continues to exist, the cut down on those, what were eliminated, and the basis for the elimination. First, the basis for the elimination. It was a combination of factors. A number of the projects either weren't sufficient enough to be scored, which meant that they didn't fall within what HUD felt at the time was the scope of what would be eligible activities, or were scored so weakly that HUD was basically indicating to the city that it would probably not be a good idea um, to continue to fund them. And then the third factor was the city deciding which activities they wanted to go forward with and the amount of money that they could allocate out of the 74 million that would allow those projects to go forward. So those were the multiple factors. So the primary one was allocation, acquisition, relocation, and demolition. That's one bucket. The original request was $33 million. The final award was $20 million and change. Second project was the Riverfront Greenway and Oak Park improvements. That was a combination of improving Oak Park that had been damaged in the flood and was also talking about connectivity along the Greenway. Um, that originally had been funded for $7,300,000. It had not been scored, which was an indication that for whatever reason, um, the HUD panel had not viewed that um, as a project justifying NDR funds. On that basis, uh, plus input um, from public meetings, again, we had over 70 of them, the decision was um, to not fund that. So that's at zero. Echo restoration in flood storage areas. This was primarily to 
because you, as you are aware from all the times I tell you, part of our flood control strategy is, in addition to flood walls and levees, is also what is simply grass areas, acres of grass areas, that based on their uh, hydrology and their relationship to the river, um, can actually absorb flood water and protect other areas of the city. So they are called flood storage areas. Right now, a lot of those areas do exist um, along the river. They are green grass. The idea was to originally to extensively reseed those areas into um, all kinds of natural growth that is indigenous to the Suris River Basin. Um, the city's decision was to reduce that from an actual project to planning funds. So it went from $2.1 million to $350,000, $357,000. The Suris River Flood Mitigation Decision Support Tool was actually encouraged in the NDRC application process because one of the things they want all grantees to do is take a serious look at factors that um, could mitigate in the future from a planning standpoint um, impact from the similar kind of disasters. That originally been requested $825,000. It was reduced to $599,000. So the subtotal for this category was $43 million. And ultimately, uh, it was just short of $21 million that got funded. Yeah. The next sec section of both the application and the action plan was building affordable, resilient neighborhoods. Originally requested for multifamily rental housing, um, LMI, low and moderate income. The original request was 30,300,000. The reduction came down to $20,897,000. Um, in the second category, there was a significant reduction, and that was for affordable single-family homes. The original request had been $39,900,000. That was reduced to $12 million. As best I can gauge um, the interaction that I was able to find, especially in the conversations um, and notes between HUD and the city, um, the city was much more comfortable in its belief that there was far more demonstrable need for LMI rental housing than there was for new construction of single family housing. So as a result of that decision, again, remember, this is in the early part of 2016, um, they sought to leave, uh, re do a lesser cut with the multifamily than the single family. Um, downtown public gathering space originally was 10,795,000, the city, was able to um, defend that, even though it was one of the lowest scored in, in the application process, um, and they reduced it to $6 million. Uh, one in the original proposal was affordable student housing for MSO, MSU students. The original request is $2,500,000. That was reduced to zero. Um, they felt that they were already putting in LMI housing, and you could associate the student housing with LMI housing, um, so it, they felt they could justify redu eliminating that. Um, same thing with the next one, there was a proposal for downtown student housing. This was more specialized um, to associate with maybe creating an art district in the downtown and, and building off um, the art focus of MSU. Um, the impact, the uh, not the impact, the uh, input that was received from HUD was that this appeared to be too far a reach for resilience funding. Um, so the original request had been $5 million. They reduced it to zero. Family homeless shelter was scored the highest in the application, so it's not surprising that the original request of $3 million remained $3 million in the actual action plan. So the subtotal for this section was originally $90 million, and the ultimate cut down was $43 million. And the final piece, um, relocation of City Hall. Um, there was originally requested $3,750,000. They maintained the $3,750,000. Uh, 
The Minot Center for Technical Education was originally at 10 million 700,000. It was reduced to 1 million 540,000. And to be honest with you, I've searched all I can and I cannot <coughs> gather why that was such a severe cut. Um, but it was, and the HUD accepted it. They didn't question it. Um, and number three relates back to the MSU proposed housing. There was a proposal to create an arts department, move an arts department and expand it in the downtown. Um, that didn't score very well, so that originally been requested at 16500000 and that was funded at zero. That did not go forward. Um, and then finally, um, these are not scored. Um, planning administration, which is a standard part of the process, cannot be more than 20% of the total grant. We are obviously much less than 20% of the total grant. We're at $5 million. 20% would be almost $15 million. Um, the original request was 9800000 The cut down was to $5 million, and that was a proportional cut down. So again, the original request was for $174 million, and we finally were told we were going to receive $74.3 million, $74 million. So that was what caused us to have to reduce and eliminate some of these programs. So that is how we got to the actual budget, and that's how we pretty much got to today. Now, there are a couple of things I wanted to share with you before we get to the actual um, NDR budget, because they do play a key role. First, the State Water Commission match funds. Um, I'll try to walk through this, because I know it sometimes can get confusing. Um, the agreement with the state from the very beginning, this goes back four or five years ago when we first received some of our original State Water Commission match funds, was always that the state said that for every acquisition or for total acquisitions, we will cover up to 75% of the expense. City of Minot, you only have to cover 25% of the expense. Currently, because we've had to aggressively use NDR funds and the state, to their credit, have been giving us additional funds during the biennial appropriations, they have not been keeping pace with the pace of our spending the NDR funds. If you look at it this way, we have allocated $20 million in acquisition, relocation, and demolition. The presumption was that if we're going to do 75-25, that means the state would give us $60 million by now. Um, in fact, it is much less. It is at um, currently under $30 million, less than 50 percent. What that means is that currently, as we stand here today, uh, the current split is only 49 percent state 51% NDR. What I've done here is an exercise to show you that if we do not spend another penny, and I'll go into this when we get to the budget, but if we do not spend another penny of NDR funds and we use the $11.9 million, that is the most recent allocation that we received uh, four months ago, um, we will still be well below the 75-25 match requirements, which means we will be fully in compliance with what the state requires. And we will still have a balance of $3 million of State Water Commission match funds to spend. That is, if we acquire everything remaining in buyout area four, everything remaining in buyout areas one and two, and everything in the current new buyout area six and six A. We will still have a State Water Commission balance. It's $3 million to spend on acquisitions. Now, caveat. Um, this is all based on current tracking, um, current estimates on what the costs are all going to be. We're tracking very close to what our estimates are. We have been for two years. Um, so our most current counter offers and offers um, are accurate. I, on a positive note, I do want to note, and I think this may be the fastest on record, we have already begun making offers in buyout areas 6 and 6A. We've already had one accepted offer, which I think is the fastest that's ever happened. Um, and we're already set a closing date for early March. Um, so these figures, I continue to increasingly get comfortable with what we're looking at. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go forward. 
The favorite subject, the CDBG NDR substantial amendment rules. I've taken this, um, and anyone that would like it, I'd be glad to email it to you. The Federal Register, August 7, 2017, which is a volu voluminous document, sets forth all the different triggers that will cause or require a substantial amendment. Um, and they are. And the first three are, well, I'll read them and I'll explain because they don't seem very clear. Any changes in the funded portion of the phase two national disaster recovery competition application that in HUD opinion adversely affects grantee ability to carry out the grant. That's one. Any changes in the funded portion of the phase two NDRC that in HUD opinion would undermine the grantee's soundness of approach. That's two. Any change in the most distressed and impacted target area. That's three. Now, what they're really getting across here is that originally, and we had talked about this back in 2017 in the first half of 2018, well, actually 2017, um, because this had not yet gone into effect. Originally, they had taken the position that if you tried to change funding on any one of your activities, they were going to rescore. So what they did is they took the rescoring component out and they put these three in. And what they're basically saying is that um, when you come and talk to us about your proposed change, we're going to talk to you and force you to justify that this still contains the same vision, purpose, and focus of your original application. It's not going to be in the context of actual number scoring, but it's going to be in the same principle. Um, the other significant difference between a substantial amendment under NDR and a typical substantial amendment under disaster recovery is that for NDR, I have to go to HUD before we actually start the process. Now, you can authorize me to proceed, but I can't proceed until I confer with HUD and HUD tells me I can proceed. Um, I'm not sure why that's in here for NDR, but it is. Um, the other standard changes are any change in program benefit, um, any change in beneficiaries, any change in eligibility criteria, allocation or reallocation of more than 10% of the grant award, addition or deletion of an eligible activity, any change in the leverage that was pledged and approved in the grant agreement. The one I want to point out to you, because I know there, and I have talked about this, there's been focus about the movement of money, 10%. Keep in mind that if, if just hypothetically, a project current in the action plan is considered next week for defunding, that is a deletion of an eligible activity, and that will in itself trigger a substantial amendment. Um, I just wanted to make you aware of that as we go forward. Um, the other key policy is the Uniform Relocation Act as it relates to the acquisitions under NDR. The key requirements going forward, um, it has to have a defined project for a public purpose for eminent domain. Everything we're doing is considered eligible. All flood control projects are considered eligible public purpose for eminent domain, both under the North Dakota Century Code and also under the HUD rules and regulations. The area for which the properties that are to be acquired have to be clearly defined. It can be done by design, plan, or construction project. We need to know a boundary because then we have to be able to show, which we have been doing um, thanks to Dan and Ryan, um, the city and the service joint river board, um, that these are the only sites we can use. We can't use alternate sites. If we, could, if we couldn't just show that this is the only site we could use, then we'd have to use voluntary acquisition. That wouldn't get us anywhere. Um, and then the other piece is that we need to know a defined boundary because we have to offer to purchase all the properties inside that defined boundary. Um, if, again, hypothetically, and I know this may be coming back to you soon, there is a shift in the M15 plan, um, they are going to have a defined boundary. So that will fit the standards. But I just want you to be aware going in that that's what we're up against. Um, 
Now for the budget. So for acquisition, there is a total current allocation of $13,701,000. We have spent $13,701,000. There is an additional encumbered out there that we have not spent yet, of $40,988. The reason that's in there and it's a negative is that we haven't gotten billed for it. Uh, in all likelihood, remember what I told you back in the state slide, that $40,000,000 will, 40, $988 will be paid by State Water Commission match. But we're showing it here as something that had been encumbered and anticipated. Demolition, we have a budget of $2,402,000. We've paid $1,489,000. We've encumbered $919,000, and we have an available balance of $6,000. However, it is all likelihood that some of that encumbered money, when we encumber something, it's against the contract. It's the maximum they could possibly spend. Our experience has been with our demolitions that we're spending somewhere in the area against what is encumbered of 50 to 60 percent. So some of this money, just for transparency's sake, eventually, some point this year, will be freed up and flow back. So the balance, instead of being minus $6,000, will actually be a positive. Relocation is currently budgeted at $3,900,000. We have paid in total $2,773,000, and the available balance is currently $1,140,000. Now, a lot of these costs, again, we can um, offset with State Water Commission match. Um, again, that's why I wanted to show you that figure in the first place. Um, and again, we're nowhere near. Um, if we stop spending all NDR money for the next two years, we still wouldn't get to 75 20%, 75%, 25%. So we're still well within what the state expects of us. Downtown public gathering space. Total allocation is $6 million. Total paid $196,000. If you will recall, and this is a good example of it, um, it's a good question to ask where do, where where do we pay CDM Smith their contract costs? And what we have been doing is very diligently, thanks to the finance department, we've been tracking it. So there were all their work is what's known as project delivery costs. So they can be charged against each of the projects. So in this one hundred ninety six thousand dollars, it is a combination of the environmental reviews we've had to do and some technical support that we have provided by CDM Smith. Um, family homeless shelter, um, total allocation, 3,041,000. We paid 765. That's our portion for the acquisition of the land, which is now owned by Lutheran Social Services Housing. Remaining conference is 2,093,000. That is the remaining contract that we have agreed, sub-recipient agreement, but that we have agreed with Lutheran Social Services. The available balance um, is $183,000. Public facilities relocation, this is City Hall. Total allocation is $3,750,000. Total paid is $8,977. Again, that was some modest technical support from CDM Smith. Total available balance is $3,741,000. Multifamily LMI rental housing. Total allocation is $20,897,000. Total paid to date is $3,878,000. That is primarily Park South 1. Um, just as an aside, um, we got our quarterly update from Park South 1. Um, they are 100% occupied. All their LMI units are 100% occupied as of this month. Total remaining uncumbered is $16,880,000. That is all the various sub-recipient agreements and contracts that we have already awarded, like Milton Young Tower, Park South Phase 2. So the available balance is $138,000. Single-family LMI housing. Total allocation is $12,807,000. Total paid to date is $1,310,000. Total encumbered is $5,191,000, and the available balance is $6,300,000. Now, 
bear in mind that part of that encumbrance is still a balance of $2.7 million in the gap financing program. We currently have 30 qualified LMI homeowners that may be using the gap financing program, and they would each get $60,000. It may be that we're, you know, and we're going to keep tracking this, but it may be at some point that we won't need the full $3 million, or oh, I would still like to see the full $3 million used, in which case there would be some flexibility in the money here. Current available balance is $6,306,449. There are, just as an example of, there are still two active potential multifamily LMI rental housing projects. Um, we have not received formal proposals yet. We're still in discussions. One is the one that you had given a very preliminary authorization to, which is beyond shelter for the senior citizen housing. Um, we're working through, um, we're actively discussing with them. They have received the low-income housing tax credit award, which is recently noted in uh, the Minot Daily News and other news media. We're currently working through that with them a due diligence process where we can come back to you with a actual formal proposal. Now, an option would be to move some of the LMI housing, single family, to multifamily, or um, not to go too far aside, but we still have uh, more than sufficient balance in the CDBG DR allocation one, where that could where the original project with Beyond Shelter was an allocation one. So we could actually use, um, if we come to fruition in, in the negotiations we're going on with them now, we could use that allocation one um, unencumbered balance to fund that project. So there's still you know, potential as an alternative to looking at NDR funds. Now we get to the planning. Now I do want to say to you that Planning is never scored. Um, we do have some balances. If there is a decision to move some money around, um, that is not going to be a problem. That is the easiest move, as long as it goes into either already identified planning activities or into um, actual project activities. So currently, um, we have the ecological restoration study. Uh, balance, the, the allocation was 357 We paid $2,300, which again was technical support from CDM Smith. We have an available balance of $355,000. So that's one that's still available. Vulnerable population study, $306,000. We still have $306,000. Um, overall benefit cost analysis, which was required actually by HUD in the beginning to show that all of our projects had a, had a justified benefit cost analysis, that was $99,900. That was almost fully spent. We have a balance of $315. Funding and financial strategies. Um, original amount was 273,375. Total paid was 16,298. Uh, remaining encumbered 3,000, so the balance is 253. The, the actual, this is where we paid for the grant report that you all received that showed the potential for up to 400 grants we could pursue and gave us the tools to be able to do that. Affordable Housing Neighborhood Master Plan, total allocation was 299,250. We paid 128,000. There's still an available balance of $171,000. Economic Resilience Strategy, we've been using that a lot. Um, original was 299. We have paid 179. There are no current encumbrances. So we still have a balance of $119,000. Minot Affordable Housing Supply and Demand Study. This was done in the beginning. Total allocation was 299. We paid um, 299, and we have a balance of $20. And the Suez River Decision Support Tool. That was again originally done um, right after the action plan was approved. The original allocation was $599,000. Total paid was 503. We still have an available balance of $96,000. Center for Technical Education, original allocation was $1,540,000, total paid $40,000. We still have a balance of $1,499,000. Now 
administration, three million seven hundred fifty-two thousand. This is capped at five percent by law. So the seventy-four million, we can only spend five percent of that money on administration. Um, total paid to date is one million two hundred thirty-six thousand. We have an available balance of two million five hundred fifteen thousand dollars, and that gives you the complete picture of where we are. i will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zakian. Uh, any questions or maybe a little further deeper dive on any of the information? Yes, uh, Alderman Pintner. Thank you, Mayor. John, just uh, you made a comment towards the beginning of the presentation with the CTE uh, being having such a drastic reduction in funding. Was how was that scored versus some of the other items? Where did that rank? Um, Mayor Sima, Alderman Pittner, um, of the low, well, the way I would say that of the lowest scored ones, that was the highest. Best of the worst. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Alderman Janser. <laughs> um, John, so going back to your comment, when, when you when you said a minute ago that the um, planning allocation money is the easiest to move, did you were you saying that the planning allocation money is the easiest to move within those categories in the planning section or into something else? Um, Mayor said, my Alderman For Jan clarification. Yeah, yeah. Alderman Jan, sir. It would be the, if I had to have a discussion with HUD, it would be the easiest discussion I could possibly have. They planning, you know, how do I diplomatically say the statutorily, um, which was a decision by Congress, not by HUD decades ago. Um, they allowed 5% of funds to be spent for um, administration, 15% for planning, and then the balance, 80% had to be spent on activities. If HUD had their way, they would definitely give you the admin, but they would just as soon see 95% of the month's money spent on activities. So, okay. Alderman Wolski. Mayor Simma, thanks. John, um, hypothetical. Sure. Adding a new activity. Uh, something, so as we look at the planning and we see the ecological restoration, uh, the, the park district has a partner and a project and a contractor going right now, uh, Audubon, North Dakota, working on various areas along <coughs> the river. Um, a lot of the planning, in essence, has been done, and, and Audubon, North Dakota, is conducting some of that. Is there an opportunity to convert planning to activity and extend something like that? Uh, because... I don't think we are we, we have achieved the the full need in terms of what what's already being done. I think there's a significant amount of need for this type of work. Um, so thoughts, um, Mayor Sitma, Alderman Wolski, um, right out of the box, I would tell you that yes, that that could be done. That would trigger a substantial amendment um, because you would be changing it from a planning um, to an actual activity and any. <clears throat> Activity does require a any ch any new activity requires a substantial amendment. Um, it was in the original um, application. Um, I, I I guess the best way I could answer you right now is I would not be thrown out the door by HUD if I brought it up because it was contemplated in the original application. I. I, unfortunately, sometimes it's best for me to say I don't have a crystal ball on how HUD's going to think, but I think it certainly is something that I could easily have a discussion with them on. Alderman Strait. Okay. Alderman Olson. So each time that we talk about a substantial amendment, what is our timeline? Does it vary from project to project, or is it are we looking at six months or what are we looking at? Um, Mayor Sitmer, Alderman Olson, it depends on um, the type and the, and the complexity. If you recall, actually, at the last council meeting, you did approve, um, or a recent council meeting, you did approve a substantial amendment, which is changing three words. That will be done in 45 days. 
um, if you're going to add an activity or you're going to delete an activity um, or we're going to exceed the 10 percent, um, that is probably going to be a much longer conversation with HUD in the first place. And secondly, it's probably going to, they're going to probably require much more work than would be necessitated. Um, I mean, to be frank, I mean, and again, I really appreciate it. And I think next week you'll see where I was going with getting that urgent need amendment into our um, action plan. Uh, I just had to change three words in the action plan. Um, it was that basic. The, I guess the best guy I can tell you is that the more language you have to either add or delete or explain in the action plan, the more time consuming it's going to get and the more um, likely that HUD is going to require additional information. Alderman Strait. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. John, say I wanted to, um, I wanted City Hall to go in the Big M building with a gathering space in the Big M building and low to moderate housing in the Big M building, since we're not going to use all that. That's something we could probably ask for, couldn't we, just to renovate and do those three things within the Big M building and not trigger a substantial amendment? Um, Mayor Simmer, Alderman Strait. City Hall and LMI housing actually would probably, whether it was the Big M building, Wells Fargo, or wherever, would probably not require any discussion with HUD. The problem with the gathering space is that we promised them two acres. That's right. It's so shocking that I would forget that element. <laughs> I apologize. Well, that's why I'm here to, you know, you. you expect me to remind you, so. <laughs> An interesting uh, proposal, though. Any further questions for Mr. Zakian? Uh, Mr. Alderman Janser. Um, so, so as we get closer to 30 September 2022, or you know that timeline <clears throat> that we're all looking at, so uh, maybe you've answered this before, but so if um, if let's say we ask for a substantial amendment to do something and you know then do we if if we got it six months before the deadline do we have to just have the money committed or do we have to have it spent or what's the you know or if we haven't spent some of this money what happens um, Mayor Sipman, Alderman Janser, I'll ask, answer the last question first. So, again, this, um, and it, it's always worth repeating, especially for the public, Congress <clears throat> established the deadline of September 30th, 2022. So it was by a congressional act. The only way that date could ever be changed is by another act of Congress. So there is no discretion. The president has, doesn't have discretion. HUD doesn't have discretion. So that is a drop-dead date. We have to have all money spent, not encumbered, spent. Any money not spent on October 1st will be grabbed by HUD and given to another grantee. Um, if you recall, on the first part of your question, if you recall, I actually, and there was, again, there was a there was method behind what I was doing. Um, several council meetings ago, we did approve a timeline and we establish benchmarks. Um, that's why there is a drop dead timeline in there for doing substantial amendments, because the likelihood of being able to do a substantial, getting HUD to approve a substantial amendment after, I believe it's in six months, um, I'm going from memory, um, HUD probably would not approve it, but if they were to approve it, we would be really pressed to make sure the money is spent. So that's why that deadline is in there. Continue. Um, so just when you when you say they would grab our money or grab the money on October 1st and give it to another grantee, is that another grantee that didn't get money the first time around in the competition or another grantee that I mean, does the, then does the time, does the clock start over for 
those folks and what happens, I mean, you know, what happens then? Um, Mayor Sitma, Alderman Janser, HUD hasn't answered that question yet. I will tell you that the standard practice um, is that if HUD recaptures funds from a grantee, it's normal, not NDR, it goes into a discretionary pot that the secretary of HUD has the ability to decide where that money goes. It is probably likely that that's what will happen here. Although, arguably, because this was a congressional act and an appropriation, the money could actually go back into the U.S. Treasury and end up going to the Department of Labor. But I think HUD is still operating on the basis that none of that money is going to be remaining on September 30th, 2022. Okay. Thank you. Well, Mr. Zakian, if uh, they if someone else's discretionary funds or if other funds end up in a discretionary and they decide to uh, reallocate, let them know, again, that Minot is their poster child of success to this point. And we would gladly accept any other funds that was taken from another grant. Uh, Very grant. good point. <laughs> any other questions? If not, we have a second uh, crack coming up in not too distant future here.